hear the church bells ring. Good morning, good morning, everybody. And welcome, good to have you all here this morning. A beautiful day. It was nice to wake up and see a little bit of snow on the ground. The kids were excited. They went out and made a snowball. They looked like a snowman. <laughs> anyway, anyway. A couple of quick announcements before we begin our worship service today. First, uh, the baby bottle boomerang continues for another week. Uh, this is to raise funds for the Community Pregnancy Center of Lake Norman. Uh, if you would like to pick up one of the baby bottles, there's still some in the back. Just uh, fill it up with change is the idea in this little slot, but you can put bills in it, you can put checks in it, whatever, and then just bring it back, and I see a number of them have already been dropped into collection plates, so thank you so much. If you are at home and you want to contribute to the baby bottle boomerang, you can just send a separate uh, donation in with your uh, regular tithing offering, uh, or you can drop it off at the church as well. Thank you very much for that. Uh, men's prayer breakfast. So we're going to be doing the men's prayer breakfast now every Wednesday morning uh, at 7 o'clock in the fellowship hall. It's BYOB, bring your own breakfast. And uh, we have uh, from 7 o'clock until 8 o'clock, usually for the first half hour, we just kind of fellowship and eat. And then from 7.30 until 8 o'clock, we have a, a devotion. So uh, every man is invited to come to that. Uh, young men, old men, uh, I bring Christopher as well, so I bring the, the, the boys as well. Uh, COVID vaccinations, I mentioned this last week. We're working with Novant Health to try to bring COVID vaccinations here to the church property so the community locally can easily access those vaccinations. Uh, we're just waiting for availability and the word from Novant Health. So if you would be interested in getting a vaccination, you have to be 65 and older at this point in time. Just let me know or let the church office know. We're keeping a list of the people who will be interested. When we find out the date that it will occur, we'll call you first if you tell us that you're interested. Um, donate Shoes for Hope. So we are partnering also with the Neighborhood Care Center to collect shoes for Hope House in Huntersville. Hope House is a uh, transitional uh, or temporary shelter for women and children who are experiencing uh, homelessness. It's pr primarily what's called situational homelessness. Maybe they lost their job or something like that. Uh, but if you have any shoes that you would like to donate, either gently used or new, you can drop them off at the church as well. Two other things I want to mention first is, uh, you know, we have the flag out front and we got our new flag last January. And so after a year, it got a little, little tired. So it's going to be retired today. And Lois uh, Wanky was kind enough to uh, donate a new flag. And she asked that we uh, donate this or dedicate this flag in memory of her dad and Avery's great-grandfather, uh, Senior Master Sergeant James Mathis of the U.S. Air Force, and in honor of all the uh, veterans who are here at the church. So thank you so much for that, Lois. Appreciate that. Nice to see those stars and stripes flying high in front of the church. Lastly, speaking of uh, veterans and uh, things that we should uh, dedicate and proclaim, February 3rd is called Four Chaplains Day, and uh, Gene McKinney asked me to share this with you. I, I shared it last year, I believe, but it's worth repeating, and I'll tell you the story here about the four chaplains. On February 3rd, 1943, the U.S. Uh, transport ship Dorchester, carrying 902 servicemen, merchant marines, and civilian workers were hit by a torpedo from a German submarine. The Dorchester sank beneath the Atlantic's frigid waters in a matter of 20 minutes. Though the, uh, through the panic and pandemonium, Reverend um, Army Chaplain's Reverend, Reverend Lieutenant George Fox, Rabbi uh, Lieutenant Alexander Good, Father Lieutenant John Washington, and Reverend Lieutenant Clark Poling, the four chaplains, uh, brought hope in despair and light in darkness by providing calm to the frightened, aid to the wounded, and guidance to the disoriented. And when distributing life jackets to the men and assisting them into rafts, they selflessly gave their life jackets up to four young men. As the ship went down, survivors in rafts witnessed the four chaplains, arms linked together, offering prayers and singing hymns. And of the 902 men aboard the Dorchester, 672 died, including the four chaplains, whose extraordinary faith, courage, and selflessness displayed on that day would be posthumously honored with the Distinguished Service Cross and the Purple Heart on December 19, 1944. 
And therefore, every year, the American Legion Post nationwide commemorate the selfless acts of the four chaplains on or near February 3rd. So a beautiful story of men who gave the ultimate sacrifice for others. All right, a lesson we lay down our lives for those we love. All right, other than that, any other announcements we need to make before we go to worship? Seeing none, Terry, can you lead us in worship, please? It'll once again be my honor. In the 96th chapter of Psalms, the Bible says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise His name. Proclaim His salvation day after day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous needs, His marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Let's sing, stand together as we sing. Shout to the Lord. The words will be on the screen. All right, now it's time for our prayer and praises. As always, we lift up the church in prayer, uh, not just First Baptist Church Cornelius, but the other two churches that meet here as well, Revive Iglesia Christiana and the Kachin Baptist Church. Uh, we pray for the church worldwide. Uh, persecuted Christians, our government, our country, the military, first responders, uh, and all in authority who uh, we pray will be led by the Spirit of God. Uh, we mentioned last week Ken Batson had passed away. He was a member uh, of the church. Uh, Lynn Brown, which is uh, Diana's cousin, doing better still. Did I lose you, Di Linda? Very good, very good. So she is very good. Uh, friends of the church, Joe and Peggy Cathy, some of you may know uh, them. Uh, they're kin to the uh, Harmons. Uh, 70th wedding anniversary this week, so praise God for that. Uh, Ann and Randy Duncan, friends of Gladys Howell, she asked that we lift them up. And then John May, which is Joe May's son, uh, is on dialysis, so pray for him. Uh, I believe he's waiting for a kidney transplant. Uh, Gwen Sternament, uh, her daughter passed away, so we lift her up. Bethany Vandershaf and baby Kaylee, this is uh, the daughter of Eric and Stephanie Rost and their granddaughter who is still in, uh, in the womb and uh, it was growing a little sl sl more slowly than it should, uh, <clears throat> but the baby is showing growth, so keep praying for the baby's growth and well-being. Uh, the family of Jerry Wally, most of you probably have heard that Jerry Wally passed away on Thursday, uh, very sad 
for that. Her funeral will be Tuesday, this Tuesday, um, at 12 o'clock. It'll be at Grace Covenant Church, uh, now, which is strange in a way because Jerry has been a member of First Baptist Church since she was a child. Uh, out here on the parking lot, her, before it was a parking lot, was her grandfather's house. And she told me stories of how her grandfather would come here to the church and get the coal stove started back in the day and how uh, they would roll her grandmother out in the wheelchair onto the porch so she could hear the pastor preaching uh, during the summer when the windows were open. But anyhow, um, she passed away and uh, she will be greatly missed. I would say she was a matriarch of the church for sure. Uh, Faison and Claudia Perry. Faison uh, had been in the hospital with pneumonia. I believe he's out of the hospital now. Do we... Okay. Oh, my. Okay, so he's not doing very well. He's in rehab, I think, and um, diagnosed with Alzheimer's and not doing so well. So let's keep him in our prayers. Uh, Rosanna and Blea, uh, friends of Laura Natale. Um, they're in Italy. I can't recall exactly what their issue is, but we'll lift them up anyway. Faye Wood, continue to pray for her. She's had a lot of loss in her uh, life recently with friends uh, from Surrey County passing away. Uh, Kit Compton asked that we lift up Lori Compton, her daughter. I believe she has COVID. And then uh, continue to lift up baby Jackson. I believe baby Jackson is doing well, um, but still in need. He was the baby that was born prematurely. I believe some of his organs were outside of his body when he was born. It's a very sad situation. So any other uh, prayer requests that need to be lifted up before we uh, go to Lord here in prayer? Yeah, sure. Char's niece, April, has COVID. Okay, anybody else? A, a praise, I love a praise. Nice. Very good. The Butterfield's uh, granddaughter, Avery, made the dean's list at App State, so very cool. Whoops, just trying to get that written down so I'd get it right. All right, all right. Uh, something else. There you go, Beth. Okay, Miranda's sick. We'll f hopefully the Lord will lead them to that or she just get better. <laughs> anyway, all right, all right. And I'll just lift up a praise. So the other night, some of you might have heard this story, but we were at the dinner table and Luke, who is five, leaned back in his chair and no sooner did I say, don't lean back in your chair, you might fall. He fell. And um, got his foot caught up in the chair, and when I got him off the, up on the floor, his toe was kind of sideways like this, and I knew that was not good. We ended up, long story short, going to the ER, and the doctor took an x-ray and saw that it was just dislocated, so he pulled on the toe, and it popped back into place. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that was a little excitement on Friday night for us, but praise God that he was not really hurt, uh, and all is good now. So, all right. Any unspoken prayer requests? I'm sure there's many. Let's take this to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we are a blessed people. We're blessed because we find our identity in your Son, Jesus Christ. And what that means is when we became believers, He gave us His righteousness and took away our sin. It's called the Great Exchange. And so now, as believers in Christ, we are spotless, blameless, sinless, holy, righteous, all of those th characteristics that are Christ's are in us. And that's how the Father sees us. That's how you see us. And therefore, we can come into the throne room of grace with complete confidence because we know that we are your sons and daughters in Christ and that you see us as we will be in glory, perfect and spotless and blameless and sinless and holy and righteous and all those things. So Lord, let us, as we lift up these names of folks who are celebrating and grieving on both sides, Lord, let us again come to you with confidence, knowing that you hear our prayers. Just as you heard your own son, Jesus Christ's prayers, you hear ours as well, because we too are sons and daughters now. And so Lord God and Father, I just praise you for that for making that way for us to be reconciled to you through Jesus. 
and for giving us that righteousness and taking away our sin. And let us always find our identity there, our identity in Christ. So when we fail, we're reminded that Christ succeeded. And by that, we are saved. And I lift all these prayers and petitions and thanksgivings to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we pray. Amen. And at this time, uh, we would normally pass the collection plate, but of course, we don't do that anymore. But the plate looks full back there, so praise God for that. And thank you all for your generosity. For those of you who are home, if you'd like to contribute to the uh, ministry of this church, you can send your donations in to the P.O. Box, uh, First Baptist Church of Cornelius, P.O. Box 100, Cornelius, North Carolina, 28031. Or you can go to the website and use the donate page. And thank you for your generosity and continued support of this church ministry. With that, Terry, can you take us and worship some more? In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bible says, no one can lay any foundation other than Jesus Christ. Let's stand as we sing hymn number 526. It's the solid rock. and his churches all around the world today. Let us pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, what a joy it is together in your house. Feel the presence of your Spirit here and seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. In fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for this another beautiful winter day for everything that you've loaned to us for our use while we're here on this earth. Thank you most of all for the opportunity for salvation that you purchased for us over 2,000 years ago with the huge sacrifices that you and your Son and your Holy Spirit made for us. Thank you for that greatest gift of all times, Lord. The opportunity for an everlasting relationship with you. Thank you for these tithes and offerings that were brought into your churches all around the world today. Multiply them, Lord. Undergird them and use them as you see fit. 
for the upbuilding of your kingdom here on earth to make our world a better place to live in to help save souls by the power of your Holy Spirit truly bless them Lord for your work in this beautiful place that you've made for us to live in please forgive us for our many sins and shortcomings help us to truly walk more like your son Jesus Christ each day Help us find a cure for coronavirus, Lord, this disease that's turned our world on its side, Lord, if it be your will. So we can help all those people suffering in hospitals and in homes around the world. We thank you for letting us find vaccines for it, Lord. And we pray that you'll help us to distribute those vaccines quickly, efficiently, and effectively all around the world with as little shrinkage as possible. Forgive us when we fail you. For it's in the beautiful, powerful, holy name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer, we pray. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Good job. Now as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's word today, let's prepare our hearts and minds for just that as we silently meditate and pray to him. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. If you are able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. And once again, this is Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you, and they will support you with their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus told him, It is also written, Do not test the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and began to serve him. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. One of the things that people come to me most often with, the concern is that somehow they're not living up to the Christian standard, right? They're not meeting the mark. And as they begin to doubt themselves because they know what's really going on in their hearts and their minds, they become somewhat depressed. They begin to lose their assurance of their salvation. Uh, And worst, some of them tend to just give up and, and drift away. And that's exactly what Satan wants. He wants to put that doubt into your mind. He wants you to believe that you aren't worthy of being a son or daughter of God. And it's true, in and of yourself you're not. But as a believer you are. Because you have the righteousness of Christ within you. And what happens when we begin to look at ourselves and compare ourselves to other people, particularly those who we think are more holy than we are, 
we then have these negative feelings. And my mentor, Jerry Martin, used to say that comparison is the death of joy. And I think he was absolutely right. So as we come into these types of thoughts in our minds, it's important to remember something else Jerry had taught me, and that was this idea of position and condition. And I've shared this with you before, but I'm going to share it again because it's a great, uh, great thing for you to know and, and really cling to. Your position is who you are in Christ. It is your true identity. As a believer, you have received the righteousness of Christ. It is credited to you. It is imputed to you. And by that, you are blameless and holy and sinless and spotless and righteous. All the attributes of Christ are granted to you when you become a believer, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. The other side of it is all your sin is given to Him. And He died on the cross with your sin. So that's your position. That's how the Father sees you. That's who you really are in Christ. But then your condition is the way you act relative to that position. And there are times when we drift far away from who we really are and we don't act like sons and daughters of God. There are other times when we do come close and we do very well. But it's those times that we drift away that we tend to doubt ourselves and tend to doubt our salvation and all those things I said earlier on. And when we come to those times, it is important for us to remember, once again, our identity in Christ. Because where we failed, Jesus succeeded. Jesus passes the test of temptation where we fail the testing of temptation. And therefore, we must find our identity in Christ and Him alone if we want to be called the people of God. And this is the point that Matthew is trying to make to his readers. All right, Matthew's audience is a Jewish audience. They, like the Pharisees that we read earlier, are putting their faith in something other than the Messiah at this point. Maybe because they're sons of daughters of Abraham, and therefore that makes them part of the tribe and, and, and part of the uh, covenant of God. Maybe it is because they follow the law, or maybe because they follow Moses. Whatever it is, it's something that they are doing. Matthew's going to make the point that you cannot fulfill the law on your own. It's a stumbling block. The only way you can become righteous is through Christ, because He succeeds where the Israelites failed. And this temptation in the desert of Jesus is a reflection of ancient Israel. We're going to see that today. And it all begins in this, this first part with what I'll say, trusting God. All right? It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now this is again a parallel to ancient Israel. If you go back to Deuteronomy 8, verse 2, it says, Remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness so that He might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep His commands. So ancient Israel was led into the wilderness by the Spirit of God as well. They were there for 40 years. Jesus was there for 40 days. Those are the parallels. And Jesus is humbled as is the people, but their pride overcame. It says, after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, one of the things that I have to say is, Satan will always try to put doubt in your mind. I mean, even with Jesus, if you are the Son of God, as if maybe you're not, he knows darn well he is, and so does Jesus. But he's still going to plant that seed of doubt. It's just like when he spoke to Eve in the garden. He said, did God really say you can't eat that fruit? He's always trying to put doubt in our minds about who we really are. But Jesus goes out to the wilderness. He fasts. He is hungry. And so Satan uses that weakness to tempt him into making bread, to take matters into his own hands. If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Should be pretty easy. John the Baptist just said that God can make sons of Abraham out of the stones. Certainly you can make bread out of it. All right? Jesus responds, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus does not fall for the devil's schemes. He passes the test in trusting that God will provide for him. And this is a, a lesson that the Israelites did not learn while they were in the wilderness. 
if we continued on in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and went to verse 3, it says, He humbled you, meaning the Israelites, by letting you go hungry, just like Jesus went hungry. Then He gave you manna to eat, which you and your ancestors had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. That's where Jesus gets His quote. But instead of learning that lesson, the ancient Israelites grumbled against Moses and against God. And if you go back to Exodus chapter 16, we can see a glimpse into that. Chapter 16 of Exodus, beginning at verse 1, says the entire Israelite community departed from Elam and came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had left the land of Egypt. The entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, where we sat by pots of meat and ate all the bread we wanted. Instead, you brought us into the wilderness to make the whole assembly die of hunger. Now, when I read this, this reminded me of my kids, right? I'm so hungry, I'm going to die, right? I hear that all the time. It goes on and says, Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. This way I will test them to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. And they don't follow the instructions either. They're only supposed to gather as much manna for the day that they can eat for that one day. And if you remember the story, what they do is they go out and they collect more because they're not trusting that God's going to provide manna tomorrow. And what happens? All that manna goes nasty. uh, That's left over. So he is trying to teach them to let go of uh, what they want and turn to the Lord in faith. And that's the same lesson that we have, right? We need to be willing to be humbled by God. To go without something in order to learn that that something isn't really as important as God's Word. All right, there's a lot of things in life that we want but may not align with God's will. And so instead of grumbling about it, hey, let's be grateful for what the Lord has provided. Is there something that you desire or hunger for, but it will disrupt your relationship with God? If it is, it is certainly something you must forego. But we must always trust God. He will give us what we need, not necessarily what we want, But what He gives us is what we really, frankly, do need. And He does what's right for us. So, go without something that you think you really need as an act of faith that God is true to His Word. All right. so on one hand, we should trust God. The other hand, we don't test God either. It's almost the same uh, coin, just the other side, because when we test God, it's really a lack of trust, a a lack of faith. Going on in the reading, it says in verse 5, Then the devil took him to the holy city, which is Jerusalem, and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. And now the Satan, Satan begins to use Scripture too. Uh, he says, For it is written, He will give His angels orders concerning you. They will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So, so Satan is basically saying, Hey, test God's Word. He says in His Word that, the, that He will charge the angels to protect you so that you won't dash your foot against the stone. So if you jump off of the pinnacle of the temple, if I go up on the top of the church steeple and I jump off, I'm going to have faith that God is going to catch me or He's going to have the angels catch me uh, and I'm going to test God's Word in that way. And of course, we're not to test God's Word. And Jesus says in verse 7, it is also written, do not test the Lord your God. Right? Don't test the Lord your God. Once again, Jesus is answering from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. And there's a little bit of that verse that's left out. And I want to bring it to your attention because it makes, makes all the difference as the fire truck goes by. <laughs> Deuteronomy 6, 16 says, Do not test the Lord your God as you tested Him at Massah. All right. So what, what is that? Now, if you were an Israelite reading or hearing the Gospel of Matthew, you would have connected that because you know your Old Testament really well. We don't know it as well, and so when we look back, we find this. So what is Massah? When did the Israelites test God at Massah? When did they fail 
in their test. Well, Massah is from the Hebrew verb, which means to test. And if we go back to Exodus, this time chapter 17, we get a glimpse into what's going on here. Chapter 17, verse 1, the entire Israelite community left the wilderness of sin, moving on from one place to the next according to the Lord's command. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So the people complained to Moses, give us water to drink. Why are you complaining to me? Moses replied to them. Why are you testing the Lord? But the people thirsted for water and grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you ever bring us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? All right, just like before. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with these people? In a little while they will stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take the staff you struck the Nile with in your hand and go. I'm going to stand there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. When you hit the rock, water will come out of it and the people will drink. Moses did this in the sight of the elders. He named the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites complained and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So those two words, Massah and Meribah, are from Hebrew verbs, Massah meaning to test, and Meribah meaning to complain. And so Moses called it the place of testing and the place of complaining. And so once again, you see the Israelites here in the wilderness faced with this um, issue and they don't trust God. They test God to see if He's really, really among them. And so... Again, Matthew is making the point to the Israelites, you failed, Jesus succeeded. And here we take that same parallel for ourselves and ask that question, are we testing God's patience? All right, by continuously disobeying or disrespecting or being ungrateful, why don't I have what I want? That kind of thing, just like they said. Are you testing God's promises? Are we desiring more than He has in store for us, thinking that somehow He's withholding from us? We cannot test God's patience or His promise. We trust in His Word, and to test is to deny the very Word of God. So do not test the Lord. Finally, we must worship God. Going on in verse 8, it says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So this time Satan tempts Jesus with power and authority and essentially riches and stuff. All right? And he's, he's, the catch is, I'll give you all of this if you just worship me. And of course, Jesus refuses and commands Satan to leave him. But of course, this is not the way it went for the Israelites when they were in the desert, right? They, throughout the history of ancient Israel, had turned to false idols and false gods. And here in the wilderness, they did exactly the same. If you go back to Exodus chapter 32, there's the story of the golden calf. And you remember that story. Moses goes up to the mountain. He's gone for 40 days. And then they say, where is this guy Moses? And they say to Aaron, make us a god that we can worship. And Aaron tells them to collect all their gold earrings and such, and they melt it down, and and he makes the golden calf, right? And then they say, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt, which of course is a false God. And then they all begin to revel and party. But they're, they're looking for their own way. They're not, again, worshiping the Lord their God who really did bring them out of Egypt. Satan convinced Eve in a similar way. He convinced Eve that God was withholding something good from her. He tells her that, you know, if you eat that fruit, You will be just like God, knowing good and evil, as if God was holding that back like God had something better. He puts doubt and desire in her mind, and she turns away from God and turns to her own desires. And this, once again, is the lesson. Ancient Israel failed 
fail to be true in their worship of God. Jesus succeeded. He never turned from the Father. He always was successful in worship. And so then that becomes the question for us. Are we tired of waiting on God's promises? All right, it happens. You want something to happen. You're waiting for something to happen. And it's something good. And it doesn't happen. And so you decide, I'm just going to make it happen on my own. I'm going to go do this in my own strength. Because apparently God is not listening. And frankly, I know that this is a good thing and it's better. right? So I decide to pursue it on my own. And of course, that is turning away from God. He has a plan for whatever it is. Do you at times feel God is holding something back from you? Man, I really want X, Y, Z. Why won't God give it to me? You know, if I win the lottery, do you know what I can do for the church? Right? <laughs> Whatever it is. I'll tell you this story because it's just fun. Anyway, so uh, during, during Bible study, I had told folks that I saw on a, a website a little cabin on 35 acres in Lake Lure. And I said to Christy, can we please, please buy this little cabin, right? And no. But anyway, so during, we're talking about it in Bible study, and, and someone said, you know, if you bought that little cabin, you could make it into a men's retreat for the church, and you all could go up there. And I'm like, yeah, that's a great idea. But that would be my own plan. That's not the Lord's plan, so we're not going to turn away. But that's the kind of thing. There's lots of stuff out there that we can uh, rationalize that, hey, it's good, and we can use it for God's glory, but... It's not in his plan for us. And if it's not in his plan, it shouldn't be in our plans. So we trust him to give us what we need and not to fall into our doubts and desires. Now, in this sermon, there's a lot of do, right? Do trust God. Don't test him. Do worship God. And those are all right and good things. We should trust God. We shouldn't trust him. We should worship him. But then I'm going to end up leading you down that same path I don't want you to go on to. And it's that path that it's all about you doing. And you're going to frankly fail. All right, You're not going to always trust God. You're going to test Him at some point. And you're not going to worship Him at some point. And then you're going to say, Pastor stood up there and told me that I should trust God, not test Him and worship Him. And boy, look at my life. It is just a wreck. I mustn't be very good. And you go right back to where we started, that I'm depressed, I doubt my salvation, and maybe I'll just drift away. And that's what Satan is trying to do, whispering in your ears. So while all those things are true, to trust God and not test His patience and worship Him alone, and that these are things we should do, our salvation is not dependent upon our performance. All right. We worship Christ because He's the one who did all these things. He has been successful everywhere we fail. And so when it comes to the time when you look at your life and say, have I lived the Christian life? I will tell you that you can say with absolute assurance, yes. I will tell you that you are perfect. I will tell you that you are spotless. I will tell you, you are sinless and blameless and righteous. But you know why? It's not because of what you did. It's what Christ did on your behalf. So don't put your identity in your failures. Jerry used to tell me, you are not your sin. Man, just remember that one. You are not your sin. But instead, put your identity in Christ because you are Christ's righteousness and all God's people said amen that is what you get when you turn your life to Christ you are allowed and able to put aside all the failures of your life and take on the righteousness of Christ He knows what you have done as much as you know what you've done, probably better than what you've done. Yet He takes you anyway. When you turn to Him in repentance and faith, you leave your sin behind and you turn to Him in faith. Now, when I say you leave your sin behind, does that mean you never sin again? It's impossible for us not to sin. 
at least in this life. When we get to glory, we will be sinless. We will be as God sees us today, our true identity in Christ, our position. You're going to continue to fail along the way. It's not an excuse, but it's a reality. And every time you fail, you get up again. Proverbs 24, 16, though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets up again. And that's the assurance we have. Christ died for us, took away our sins, gave us his righteousness. And when we fall, we get up again. We confess our sin. We continue to fight and turn from it. And we pursue Christ. Paul said, I have not yet attained the goal. Now, if Paul hadn't yet attained the goal, certainly no surprise we haven't either. But we will be there in glory. And that's how the Father sees us today. He sees His Son when He sees you in Christ. So for those of you out there who are listening, if you would like to have the righteousness of Christ to shed your sin for all time and have eternal life in Christ Jesus, today is the day. Scripture says, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Turn from your sin and turn to the Savior and you will be saved. It's a promise of God. For those of you who are here who are believers, and certainly if anybody here wants to give their life to Christ today, you can. But if you're even a believer and you have something you want to share, come forward and let me know. And then, of course, if anybody here wants to join the church and become members, let me know that as well. But first and foremost, be praying that someone gives their life to Christ today. Terry's going to lead us in the invitational hymn. I'll be down here. And let's pray that someone gives their life to Christ. Amen. Our invitational hymn is Yield Not to Temptation. The words will be on the screen. Let's we'll stand while we sing. Thank you.
And now depart to go into the world knowing your identity in Christ and living out that identity as closely as you can, serving the Lord and serving your neighbor and proclaiming the salvation that is through Christ and Him alone. To the glory of God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and His Son, Jesus, in whom we pray. Amen. Amen.